Welcome everyone. I'm making a game in which creatures can evolve. Each creature is created automatically from a DNA sequence, so I can easily mutate or merge them. When I let two creatures mate, the children inherit properties from their parents. When I add a mechanism that controls which creatures get to reproduce, they will evolve over time. In this video I want to show how this generator works and what it can do. I'm using it as the core for the game I'm developing, where beasts were born, and I want to introduce this game at the end of the video. So let's get started and roll the intro. Um, hang on, let me just... There. Let's take a list of properties and call them genes. Then we'll write a program which takes these and turns them into a mesh, textures and animation skeleton. To create a single creature we need to choose values for each of these genes. Let's call these the creature's DNA. Each of these values can range from 0 to FFFF, and in order to use them we need to first map them to a sensible range. For some genes, I simply do this by mapping to a fixed range. However, I also want genes to be able to influence each other, so for some of the genes the range depends on the chosen values of other genes. I can use this to let the torso length influence the maximum possible tail length, or to make sure that the final creature doesn't look like a colorful disco ball. To build a 3D mesh from the DNA, I first figured out how to build each part manually and then automated the process using Blender's Python API. I start by creating a curve, which will act as the spine. Then I add a low resolution circle and start blocking out basic segments. This part is inspired by nature because insects often have very distinct segments, which I want to be able to model. The next step is to connect the segments and block out a basic head as well as a basic tail. I use the duplicate and bridge edge loop functions a lot because I find these really convenient to translate into code. I then model an antenna and attach it to the head. The legs are slightly more complex than the antennae. I first decide where I want the foot to be placed, but then instead of connecting the hip directly to the foot, I create segments which will act as joints later on. The number of joints as well as their position and shapes will later be controlled by genes in the creature's DNA. I use the bridge edge loops function to connect the leg to the torso and then build the other legs in a similar way. Of course the DNA will also control how many legs will be placed and where. Then I'll turn this into code. The program also starts with a spine, then blocks out basic segments, connects these segments and adds a head and a tail, then it starts creating antennae, then the hind legs, then the front legs, and finally it can add some optional spikes to the back. And then we have our first generated creature. When you look closely you'll notice that the shape is no longer a perfect octagon. This is because I added genes which control the placement of a vertex along the radius and around the circle. This creates much more interesting body shapes. While building the mesh, I save various properties in each vertex, such as the position of the vertex around the body, the distance along the legs, or whether a vertex is part of a spike or not. I can then use this information in a huge messy material tree, the details of which I'll spare you from. The result is a material where the inputs are again controlled by various genes in the DNA. Whenever I want to use these creatures in a game, I simply bake these materials to texture files. At this point we're done with the mesh generation, so let's try it out and hit that generate button a few times. My creatures are generated procedurally, so I also need a procedural animation system. I use a system similar to the classic snake game to move the torso segments, then I calculate where the feet should go, and then use inverse kinematics to position the legs. I could probably fill a whole video just showing how I did all of that, but it would be a video full of failure, anger, despair, sadness, weird bugs, unnatural distortions and whatever this is. It would only show a few successful moments here and there. So I'll probably skip making this video and instead summarize its content in one sentence. If you can avoid it, never ever ever write your own inverse schematic system.
Writing the basic system is fun, but as soon as you get to adding angular constraints and skinning, it quickly becomes a nightmare. Despite all this, I think I'm now pretty much at a point where I can use the system in-game, and anything that still looks weird will just make the creatures look creepier. Now, before we start mating creatures, I want to highlight a few important properties of the generator. When we input a random DNA, we get a certain creature. When we input that same DNA again, we expect to get that same creature as a result. In other words, the generator is deterministic. However, if we now make small changes to the DNA, we expect the resulting creature to be slightly different. I call this property continuity. For some of the genes, like the tail length or the width of the head, this is trivial. But there are some steps in the process where it's not quite so obvious. For example, when I want to create the legs, I need to choose from which of the torso segments to grow them, but the number of torso segments can change. In a similar way, each segment defines certain points where spikes could be added, but I need to choose from which of these points I actually want to grow spikes for a certain creature. And lastly, when shaping the legs, each of the legs joints is offset by a certain amount, but I don't know how many joints I'll have until I actually start creating the creature. I could solve this problem by using a traditional random number generator and then using the genes as seed values. The problem here is that changing this gene slightly would result in an entirely different random number sequence, which would break the continuity. Instead, we can use a smooth 2D noise function and let the gene decide which horizontal line we're looking at. Then we can sample equidistant points along that line, which act as our random numbers. If we plot all the values along that red line in a 2D graph, you can see how our random numbers vary between 0 and 1. Now if we choose a different gene or different seed, we get very different numbers. However, if we change the gene only slightly, then you'll see that the numbers that we now get are very similar to those that we originally sampled. If we repeat this process multiple times, you can see how smooth interpolation in the gene now leads to a smooth interpolation in the random number sequence. And this is where the fun begins. I said before that changing the leg shape smoothly can be quite difficult. So let's try it out with this new system. I'd start with a certain gene for the leg shape and then slowly interpolate to another one. Speaking of fun things, we can now take the DNA from two parents and merge them by cutting out segments from each parent. This is usually called the crossover operation. For example, we can take the DNA of the left parent and replace all those genes controlling the leg with those from the right parent. This gives us a creature that looks a lot like the left parent, except for its legs. Or instead of the legs, we could replace the spine, which gives us a creature that looks a lot like the creature on the left, except that it has the spine from the creature on the right. And because we went through all that trouble with the continuity, let's also try interpolating the spine. Um, gross. To give evolution a chance to invent new things over time, we'll also add a mutation operator, which can randomly mutate some of the child DNA's genes. And now it's finally time to find a mate. Oh, well, hello there, handsome. And after a long pregnancy period of about 2.7 seconds, we'll see children appear. Now, of course, if we had chosen a different mate, the children would look quite different. To create these families, I use both a crossover operator and some mutation. That means that the children will resemble their parents for the most part, but there will be some slight variation here and there. It may be fun to pause the video here and try to figure out which properties were inherited from which parent. Now suppose we create a random generation of creatures and rate them according to some metric. We then sort the creatures and let the highest rating creatures reproduce more often than the lower rating ones. In this way, the new generation of creatures will inherit more genes from the higher scoring creatures and will hopefully become better according to the metric. This procedure is called a genetic algorithm and there are many great online resources if you're interested. Now the question is, what should we use as the metric or scoring function? Well, we could start by choosing the sum of the length of all of the legs as a scoring function. As you can see, this encourages creatures to have long or many legs. 
Or we could choose a function that encourages short torsos, long hind legs, and short front legs. Or we could build procedural cave systems, then let the players play witches which enter these caves, searching for magic mushrooms as their source of power. And then the scoring function could be how well the creatures defend their habitat against these intruders. As you may have guessed by now, this is the idea behind the game where beasts were born. There are still many milestones to reach before the game is done, but it will be an exciting journey, and I do hope you will follow along.